go. Uh, welcome my Year 9 General Science class. I hope you've had a lovely holiday. Uh, lovely wet day here today. Uh, good time to do some podcasting in advance of um, next term. We're going to start by looking at light. We're going to be looking at energy for quite a while, a few, quite a few weeks. And uh, light is one form of energy that uh, we use a great deal for all sorts of wonderful things. So, we're going to look at energy. Is light a wave, a beam, or a photon? Think about refract refraction and reflection. Look at how we use lenses. Have a think about colour. And then, what applications of this stuff can we have? And of course, applications of, uh, of light energy. Uh, well, there's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots. <clears throat> we'll have a look at a couple of them. Um, you're going to have a test on this in about two weeks' time. But in the meantime, we're going to do lots of crack work trying to make sense of all this stuff. And obviously this podcast here is for you to come back to and have a look at what we've been doing. So generally, physicists tend to argue about whether light is a wave of energy, a single photon of energy, or a beam. And I suppose they, they sort of talk about now as, as a photon, which is sort of a, a bundle of energy which is transferred in a wave. So they're having a bit each way by saying things to me. Um, but I'm a biologist, what would I know? Interestingly, of course, light is the fastest, or, uh, yeah, light moves the fastest of anything on our, in our universe. So light travels at 300,000 kilometres per second. So it takes only eight minutes to arrive from the sun each day, all the time, obviously. Um, so it's incredibly fast. Nothing goes faster than the speed of light. And in fact, on a planet, we have synchrotrons and things like the CERN, where we try and get energy up to around about the speed of light. Uh, to do lots of interesting experiments, but that's for another day. <clears throat> so, refraction. Light bends, and we call that refraction. As you can see there, there's, I think it's a fantastic photograph. We've got two glasses with water in them, one in front of the other, and the green bottle behind. And because of the manner in which the light bends through those three objects, we get that wonderful image of the green bottle at the back as if it was empty in the middle, which is, uh, I, don't know, I just like it. It's uh, one of those fancy little things that gets you, gets, um, gets your interest, I suppose. Um, so as light moves from one substance to another, it bends. And as it moves between different types of substances, it can bend different amounts. So it travels fastest through air, and then slows down through water, and then obviously even slower through um, uh, solid objects like glass. And we can see that in that photograph. Fascinating. Um, total internal reflection. As you can see, that lovely image in the top uh, right-hand corner there, those lovely uh, diamonds. They trap the light with inside, so that lights enter that diamond. The um, jeweler has been able to cut that diamond so carefully that the light get, gets trapped inside and sparkles like that, which is just a beautiful outcome, isn't it? And of course, it's not just jewellers who try and do that. With, we do that with optic fibres. And so, of course, the government's supplying us, well, if you're lucky enough, then you might have some of your house, um, optic fibre to the, to the uh, street and then the old copper cable to your home. But if we get that optic fibre all the way to your home, then the ability for light to move at almost the speed of light down those optic fibres is greatly increased. And of course, that means the ability to send information as bundles of light down optic fibres is going to be almost the speed of light. The only real problem that slows everything down is the junction points, and you've got to sort of stop somewhere and decide which way to go. But it's fascinating, fascinating to watch the manner in which that light has entered that, um, that gem and then scatters when it comes out. Beautiful. Um, and we'll have a play with that in one of our experiments. <clears throat> one of the really important things, especially for those of you in the class who wear glasses or, or contact lenses, is the development of, of lenses. And of course, Galileo was involved in taking lenses and looking towards the sky with his telescope. And we will have all used microscopes at some stage where we've, we've used lenses to focus onto smaller things. So there are two main types. Convex, as you can see there, it's um, sort of that, that shape out. Uh, so a convex lens, also calls, called converging, because as you can see, they cause the light here. It's coming into the lens, so the light starts on this side, to the left of the screen, travels through our lens, and converges on the focal point. Um, and uh, this is this length here from the focal point back to the lens is called the focal length. We'll try and measure some of those 
in our experiment. Um, so, of course, these parallel lines have been reflected, or sorry, refracted into each other, and they're all meeting that, that, that point there. These produce a real image. So, convex lenses produce real images. I'm stressing that because the next type, the concave lens, is said to produce a virtual image. You can't actually um, project this onto a screen as you can with convex lens because the focal point is actually in front of the lens. So in this case, we have that concave, that's sort of caving in, and that gives it the name. Um, and they're diverging lenses because as light travels from the left, hits the screen, here hits the uh, lens, it refracts and scatters on the other side, so it diverges. And interesting enough, the focal point of that, of the reflection of this lens is here, which is not what used to us in some in that sense, but in other senses it's quite handy. Um, we'll keep moving. This is actually <clears throat> really interesting because we this is where we you know we make glasses for people to correct their vision. Those of you who've done natural sciences or will do natural sciences will look at the eye and, and the eye as a sense organ. Um, so we're not going to spend much time on that. And it's obviously it's a complex um, device. But essentially, light again coming from the left here comes through this little space here, we've got a hole in our eye, um, and that hole has this lovely lens seen behind it, a convex lens, which focuses the light onto the back of the eye, onto this retina. And then the information is collected and enters the optic nerve and out to the brain. Interestingly enough, the light coming through one convex lens gets flipped, the image gets flipped upside down. So our brain has to accommodate for that and reflip it. Um, and of course, all these little ligaments here and muscles around the eye allow us to stretch and squash this lens so we can focus it, depending on what image is coming in, so we can do a bit of fine focusing. And as we age, that ability to find focus can be lost as it um, becomes a bit stiffer, the actual convex lens becomes a bit stiff, and these lens, these um, ligaments and muscles get old and tired and stiff as well and our ability to react and change you know, is reduced so people as they age can need glasses because of that <clears throat> so we have three main types of um, vision problems myopia which is uh, short-sightedness and so in this case the person's eye focuses in front of the retina so the retina is where the light needs to arrive at the back of the eye for the nerve to get the information um, and so we actually correct those with concave lenses. So the diverging lens is used to correct the problem with myopia. With the hypermetropia, long sightedness, the focus is actually behind the retina. So it's gone too far. And so you get this fuzzy vision, you know, actually seeing things. So again, we can correct that, but we correct that in this, this case with a converging or convex lens. And obviously you go to an optometrist and they sort of measure distances involved and work out the best lens to put in front of your eye. Putting a lens in front of your eye means you've now got two lenses. So you imagine that the image is now the right way up at the back of the eye, and the brain has to get used to that and not go flipping your images upside down. Um, and as I said before, as, our, as we age, our eyes sort of lose their flexibility, and our focus can actually start to, to struggle a bit. And this is something we call prespopia, prespopia. And unfortunately, I think I'm in that way myself. We, we start to need reading glasses, and I'm finding um, some books harder to read than others, especially at night when I'm having a last little read in bed before I go to sleep. So it might be time to go see an optometrist and just see if I need to be a correction. Anyway, old age sucks, eh? Um, <clears throat> colour. We say that white light is made of seven colours, which are the colours of the rainbow. Now if you think about it, that's red, and you can see from our rainbow red on top. Red, orange, yellow, green, and then we have, um, we have the four, right? red, orange, yellow, green. And then we've got violet, no, blue, violet, indigo. Yeah. Some people suggest that the blue, are, blue violet, indigo, indigo are probably only two colours. <clears throat> but the guy who discovered this was uh, Sir Isaac Newton, and he was quite a superstitious character. And seven was a more, um, more satisfactory number for him. Six was the number of the devil, and he didn't like six. So there's a story that he made of a seventh colour just so that uh, he had a seven instead of a six. 
you know, so next time I have a look at a, uh, a rainbow, which you can do very soon with your um, your uh, light kits, just see if you can find seven colours. See if you can actually divide those three blue ones up into, uh, in fact, three colours. Um, each of these colours has a slightly different frequency, and so they each bend slightly differently when they're scattered. <clears throat> so with a rainbow we're looking at there in that picture, we're seeing the light scattering through the water in the atmosphere. So that it's just had rain, you see the big rain cloud behind, the air's all wet, and the light's now scattering through that and creating that lovely rainbow. You do the same thing with uh, grass, glass crystals. We're going to do it with glass crystals soon. And you can see how they bend the light. So we talk about red on top, it's bending the least, and blue on the bottom, so it's bending the most. And we talk about things being infrared, so there's light energy, or there's energy above that red we can see, that our eyes can't see, and there's also ultraviolet light, so there's light below the blue that other animals can actually see that we can't. And that's just higher energy and it's bending more, but our eyes can't cope with that. So, colour. I've got a blue jumper on today, I've got a grey jumper. That's about, not very useful, is it? Um, why do we see objects in colour? Well, essentially that the diagram here is a good explanation. So rather than my blue jumper, which is grey, um, we've got a yellow lemon. And all that light, that white light arrives, but of course it's bands of colour. And as that light hits the surface of this object, the pigments in that surface cause the yellow light to reflect. But it absorbs all the other colours. And so we see yellow because when we see something, we see the light reflecting off it. But the other colours have all been absorbed into here. I'm going to play that. Um, so our eyes have three types of cone cells, and they receive red, blue, and green, which are the, our primary colours, basically. Um, we also have um, rods. Hang on. Yeah, they're cones. Rods see, give us sort of shade and depth, They're sort of black and white, if you like. Um, so our primary colours. Now the artists in the room are going to be unhappy, but the primary colours to physicists are red, green and blue. And you can see why in the chart down here. If I take red, blue and red, <laughs> green, <laughs> blue and red, and I project white light through the three of them, in the middle we get white. So when you add the three of them together, you get white. When you add green to red, you come up with amber, secondary colour, green and blue, you get cyan, secondary colour, and blue and red gives you magenta, a secondary colour. Blend all three primaries, white. And you may have done that sort of thing in primary school or even junior science when you've made colour wheels. And as fast as you spin them, you get this lovely white finish. So when you look at it, it looks white. So it's confusing your eye. The eye's doing the blending. So, how can we use all this wonderful knowledge? <clears throat> well, most of you own sunglasses. I hope you own sunglasses. Sunglasses should be owned by everybody, of course. Sunglasses allow us to protect those lovely eyes of ours, the corneas particularly, from um, things like cataracts and, and skin cancers for eyes, if you like, so the effect of ultraviolet light. Um, and so we use polarising sun, uh, sunglasses like this guy here. So light travels at a transverse wave, so it vibrates at right angles, and this scatters that. So it actually scatters the UV light before it hits the back of the eye. Um, really clever, and we're going to watch a little video that explains much better than I just did then how this thing works. But clearly, if we can polarise that light, we can actually cause it, the energy to be absorbed and not pass into the eye. So it's rather useful. I'm sure you've all been to a 3D film by now and worn the 3D film glasses. If you ever watch a 3D film without the glasses, you can clearly see the blue and red sort of sitting beside each other. Really weird effects, very hard to watch without the glasses on really. Uh, it'd be probably quite tiring. But if you put the glasses on, they then blend the blue and red coming off and you get a, an image, a 3D image because of that. Really quite clever. Um, and obviously you don't need to buy theirs, you can make your own. Bit of blue cellophane, bit of red cellophane, bit of cardboard, you make your own. Um, and again, all you're really doing is causing the brain to get confused, tiring it out even more. And many of you, of course, will be going off to um, music concerts and uh, soon enough going to clubs and things, and there's people there who really 